your Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 21. We'll start reading in verse 10. We'll go down through about verse 18. We'll have a word of prayer. And then at that, uh, after that, if you will, you can be seated. Why don't you stand with me? This will give you an opportunity to stretch and smile. Amen? Stretch and smile. It's good to smile. Amen? You know, when you're smiling, they never know what you're thinking. So just keep on smiling. Amen? That's the way I look at it. Amen. All right. Pastor, thank you for the privilege. Thank you for the opportunity. It's good to see you again, my brother. And we had just a little bit of fellowship before service. I shared with him that we had the 50 plus saved and uh, so forth and so on. Uh, Listen, we have been going from Sunday to Sunday, 31 services. Now that's a little over four services a day, amen. If you don't get sanctified and preserved in that, I don't know what's going to get you preserved, amen. And so we're a little tired, but... uh, Yesterday, we were out busy. We was doing ministry. Uh, We was on a boat, and uh, that's the second time, I think this is our ninth or tenth year, that we've been on a boat, and we were rainbow trout fishing, amen? And all I caught was them little itty bitties, okay? Something like that right there. Have to throw them back, catch, throw back in. But he twisted my arm, and I had to go, amen? So, all right, look with me. Acts chapter 21, let's start in verse 10. And we'll go down through about verse 18. We'll have a word of prayer, and then again you can be seated. And, we, and as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we had heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What mean you to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, The will of the Lord be done. And after those things we took our, uh, excuse me, Verse 15, and after those things we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. There went with us also a certain certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Nason of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. uh, gladly, and And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James and all the elders were present. Now let's have prayer and then you can be seated. Our Father, again, it's in the blessed name of the Lord Jesus. It's with a grateful, thankful heart that we bow. I want to say to you tonight that I love you. Thank you for this privilege. Thank you that Pastor McGovern McGovern would give us this opportunity. And I think about what Paul said. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and of power that your face should stand, not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Give us, Lord, would you lend us? I'm just a sinful man, Lord. But would you, in your kindness, lend me thy power, persuasion, and presence to preach to these people. Lord, that that you accomplish and that that you want to do, we'll thank you and praise you for all, all of it. Lord, as you look at this congregation, it's Wednesday night. Usually it's the people of God that's faithful to the house of God. But I don't know. There could be someone with us tonight lost. And I ask you, Father, that you might do a work of grace and save that sinner, save that person, bring them into the family of God. Lord, I'll thank you. I'll praise you because I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Look with me tonight. I want to take my thought as you think about this and One sense of the word, it's a topical outline, but yet I think it's implied in the verse. And if you will, notice with me verse 16. There went with us also a certain, excuse me, there went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Nason of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. I want to talk to you for just a little while on the subject of Nason, the old disciple. When you think about Nason, the old disciple, this is the only verse 
that is given to him in all of the scriptures. And yet at the same time, I think about Luke as he writes the book of Acts, as he's pinning it down, he comes to this verse and he writes what he has to say and it's as if he takes and he puts the pen, the pen down and he doesn't come back to it anymore. He just makes that statement. He talks about uh, uh, a nascent here, that he was an old disciple, that he came from uh, Cyprus and, and that he had a home and he wanted the brethren to come and lodge with him. You know, when you think about Nason, I can say that he had a father and had a mother. And really, anything else, I really don't know. I don't know if he had siblings, if he had brothers, if he had sisters. I don't know that later on in life, if he married and took a wife and loved her a lifetime and now he's by himself. I don't know if they had children. I don't know nothing about it. Secondly, as you think about this passage of Scripture, uh, I thought about uh, Cyprus and Jerusalem. I thought about how far it is. I, I looked and I studied, and I finally went to the source of authority. I asked Siri, and Siri told me about 256 miles, amen. And I think that's uh, 53, 56, something like that. And so I took Siri at her word. She said, as the crows fly. Okay, all right, we'll go on, okay. But, you know, as you think about this, let me give you three things to think about. May I say, uh, just by way of introduction, I'll go into my thoughts and we'll go from there. First of all, our Lord brings his name to our attention. Why would he bring his name to attention? Well, I think there's a reason why, and that's number one, a remembrance. If you look in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10, he says these words, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed towards his name, and that you have ministered and do minister to the saints. And here this old gentleman is. He's an old disciple. How old he is, how long, and so forth and so on, I can't tell you a lot about it. But I know that the Lord brought him out. Again, it's like I said, Luke, he takes his pen, he writes this down. He's under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He puts down this man's name. It's forever settled. He doesn't write any more about him. It says, again, he just put the pen down. And then secondly, I think about not only that, but I think about the fact that it's a reminder. And what I mean by a reminder is that no matter how small, and can I say this tonight? I really don't know this congregation. Forgive me if I'm a little bit forward. I don't mean it that way. But I don't know about you, but we're small people. We're not up here, and we, we've not made the millions. If you have, see me after service, because I'd like to share with you a burden about paper at the print shop. Amen. But if not, you can pray with us about that. And here's what I'm saying to you. We're just small people every day. You know, we, we don't rub necessarily shoulders with the Bidens, we don't necessarily rub shoulders with uh, the Trumps, we don't necessarily rub shoulders with the actors, uh, uh, and so forth and so on. And you know, we're just, in that respect, we live our lives. We go about our business. We turn old, and one day we pass off the scene. We go to glory. That's the good part for you and I. I don't know about you, I'm looking forward to it. I guess you heard the story about the little fellow, he was in Sunday school. And uh, the Sunday school teacher, she kept saying, how many wants to go to heaven? Raise your hand. How many wants to go to heaven right now and raise your hand? And uh, he wouldn't raise his hand. And uh, y'all heard this, forgive me, okay? But uh, anyway, after service, I mean, after Sunday school and they were walking out, she kept him back. She asked him, she said, do you not want to go to heaven? And he said, oh, yes, I want to go to heaven. And she said, well, why didn't you raise your hand? And he said, well, I thought you was talking about a boatload right now, and I don't want to go right now, amen? And that's the kind of the way it is with you and I. One of these days, we'll slip past, we'll be gone, our lives will end. The next thing for you and I will be the judgment seat of Christ, and then we'll come back on white horses with him, we'll set up, uh, we'll reign with him for a thousand years in the millennium kingdom. But as you think about it again, I'm trying to get you to see something. The Bible says in Hebrews 4 and verse 13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. 
This morning when you got up, you washed the uh, uh, sleep out of your eyes and you begin to prepare your day. I don't know if you're discouraged. I don't know if you're carrying a heavy burden. I don't know what might be uh, in your life, the stone that seems to be impassable or, or, or you can't move it. I don't know. But may I say to you, listen, when we tend to think that our God and our Savior has forgotten us, he's still right there. He's ever, you're ever in his presence, and he knows. You know, listen, the old country preacher told me one time, I, I was talking to him about prayer. Grand, precious gentleman. I worked at a chemical company. He worked at another. I'd have to take my truck down and weigh it and then come back with a full load, weigh it again, and then off to the place that I was going to deliver it at. And uh, you know what I'm saying? I, I was talking to him. I was just young, started out just preaching. I said something to him about prayer, and he made this statement. He said, if God don't answer my prayers, he said, I'm going to get out on my knees and find out why. Now, that's some of the best theology that I've ever heard. You, you say, well, I don't really know how to pray. You just pray to learn how to pray. Seek his face. Call unto him. Call while he may be heard. Jeremiah 33 and verse 3, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You know, when I think about Alaska, I think about the head chaplain here in the state of Alaska, and I think back about three, three and a half, four years back, and he looked at me and he said, Brother Gregory, and I said, yes, sir. He said, give me eight. No, give me nine more men. And God gave us Brother Patterson, and he's unique He's unique in his, uh, in his own way, and God is using that man. But there's more institutions up here. There's more institutions, and if a man wants to raise his support and come and do a work for God, and that man may be right here and reach souls and, and win men and to disciple those men and, and share the gospel and share the word of God and see men saved, you have the ability right here. We serve, Gail and I, as representatives of the ministry. And one of the things that we do, and I'm not trying, I'll get off of it and just go on in just a second. But one of the things that we do, and it's not a spiritual word, but it's recruiting. It's recruiting. And what I'm saying to you by that is we're trying to duplicate ourselves. We're trying to bring in more families. Why? For the purpose of a world uh, uh, that's going to hell, lost without God, and on the road to hell. I, I watch Brother David, and my, he's sharp, and everywhere we go, he's passing out that gospel track. May I give you a gospel track? Let me give you a gospel track. May I give you a gospel track? May I say to you, he and I, we've been giving out Independent Baptists of Anchorage gospel tracks. I've talked to people, and I've told them about you here in this area, and I, I want them to know, uh, you know, we were, I think it was Durham's or Dunham's or something. I, I don't know. It was a department store. I needed a belt. And we were coming out, and I invited a man to the church tonight. I don't know if he's here or not. I, I, I don't think he is. But that's our business. That's our business, to reach men and women, boys and girls, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me go on very quickly. He's an old disciple. And Adam Clake says this about him, possibly an early convert from Pentecost. Albert Barnes makes this statement, he was possibly a convert before Christ's death. But I like what John Wesley says. Wesley states, possibly one of the first converts in Jerusalem. And so let me give you four things very quickly, and we'll be done in just a few minutes. I asked the pastor, how long do you want me to take? He said, I'm not going to put a time limit on you. They love preaching. Thank you. Amen. I, was, I started saying, can I get an amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And, and so forth. And, and so we might be here till 10 o'clock tonight. But listen, I got the longest flight home, okay? So anyway, look with me. Let me give you four things. First of all, I want you to know his, uh, notice with me his life as an old disciple. There's two things. His name, Mason, Mason means. And then secondly, his, uh, his title, disciple, means. First of all, I want you to notice that he has two meanings in his name. Number one, he was a diligent seeker. It means a diligent seeker. 
I think when I think about that, it's Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of the throne of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Why? <clears throat> because you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And there's two verbs that I want you to notice with me. He first starts out and he says, seek. And after you're saved, if you then be risen, after your salvation, you've been converted to Christ. Seek those things which are above, where Christ setteth at the right hand of the throne of God. I think about a man, he was a deacon for many years, and God called him to preach, and he's pastor in the church now. He's in a little place in Virginia, back in the hills, I mean back in the hills. I, I think they pump in sunshine and they pump out moonshine, amen? That's how we say it down home. But, you know, uh, and I say that with tongue-in-cheek, okay, or jokingly. But, you know, I think about him, and we would sit for hours and hours. And I just love to listen to him because he's going through the Gospels. He's so meticulous. He has so much that he wants to share. And he'll tell me, you know, I'm going to preach on that one of these days. I, I'm underlined that. I marked it. And I'm going to give that to my church one of these days. And we'll go a little farther. And he says, I'm going to give that to my church one of these days. I'm going to preach on that. And that's where we should be. Seeking those things which are above. As Proverbs talks in one passage, as iron sharpeneth iron, so should our, our countenance sharpeneth one another. And it's as if we are a, 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 we are a knife and our brothers are a weeping stone and we sharpen ourselves. We, we hone ourselves and we get ourselves sharpened by one another uh, and those that are around us. You ought to spend some time if possible. You know, I think about where I served just for a little while, about seven years. I, I was a chaplain in a little jail and a big day for us at that jail was 300. And I'd always tell the residents at that jail, I'd say, if you got questions, write them down. Write them down, and when I come back through, let me know, and I'll try to answer your questions. If I can't, I'll try to find you an answer. Uh, you know, and we'll go from there. You know how many uh, questions I was given? Uh, how many questions, how many people uh, asked me questions? Right there. Zero. In seven years, I would say that to the inmates, the residents there, and they never wrote a question down. They never answered a question. And what I'm saying to you by that is where are you going to learn at? When you're reading through the Scriptures and you don't fully understand this, what does that mean? What I'm trying to get you to see is to go to wise men, go to your pastor, Go to your youth pastor. Go uh, to your assistant pastor, Brother Mitch, and ask them. All they can do is look at you and say, I don't know, but I'll try to get you an answer, amen, and, and come back and give you something. Why? So you can grow in the grace and the love and the knowledge of the Lord, amen. Well, let me go on. Y'all look like I need to. I want you to notice with me. Secondly, he was an exhorter. He was an exhorter. In, in Titus chapter 2 and verse 15, the last verse of chapter 2, he says, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. And he was an exhorter. You know, when you think about it, it, it simply means to encourage. It means to excite, excite. It means to enable others with courage or the spirit and strength that they can accomplish what God wants them to accomplish. You look over in Ephesians chapter 3, it's in the uh, prayer there, second prayer uh, in the book of Ephesians. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power of God that worketh in us. And God has the ability. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And, and you can, you can grow in that grace and the love and the knowledge of the Lord. His title, disciple, means, and it, it speaks of a learned one, a taught one, a taught one by the master. And listen, every day that you get into that blessed book, every day, and sometimes you may think, well, I, I didn't get nothing today. But oh, what about those precious times when God comes and he speaks to your heart and he pulls you down to a verse or verses or a chapter and he says, this is for you. And he begins to speak to you and he begins to unfold truth 
to your heart and to mine. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of the throne of God. And then he says, set your affection, set your mind on the things of, uh, uh, above and not on things of the earth. If some of you are from the lower 48 and you're older like myself, you may have heard this in times past, especially, I don't know about the northern states or the western states, but in the southern states, they'd say he's so uh, heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. And I've heard that a many a times. But I want to say to you, when you get heavenly minded, you are earthly good. That's what this world needs to see. That's what this world needs to hear. It needs to uh, have a kind word and a smile and a gospel track if they'll take it. And if they don't, then that's their business. You can walk away. But listen, to share that love of Christ and to tell men and women about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Well, may I say to you, secondly, not only his life as an old disciple, but I want you to notice with me another thing that I feel like it's implied in this verse. Notice with me, the Bible says in this verse, with whom we should lodge. And I want you to notice his longing for fellowship. He has a home there, and, and he's going back to that home, and he invites everyone in. Can you imagine sitting and listening to the Apostle Paul? Can you imagine the wisdom that that man gave and all that he shared? Maybe some of the revelation uh, as he's beginning to write a letter or something. Uh, maybe that takes place at this time. And he begins to share with the people of God there. And that's what Sunday morning, that's what Sunday night, that's what Wednesday night does for you and it does for me. If you're praying about something, you've been asking God, and you've been saying, Lord, will you give me scripture? Will you help me with this? I think about taking a large team down to Louisiana State Penitentiary, 5,000, I think it's 5,208. It's been several years ago. I'm not back in there anymore, but long story short, I needed a team of 100. And, you know, I begin to pray about it, and I come to church on a Wednesday night. I'm, I'm, I'll just be honest with you. I'm, I, I'm I was apprehensive. I was scared. You all haven't ever been there. But when you need a team of 100 people that will come and witness, witness to men that has their master's degree, witness to men that are on death row, that uh, there was one gentleman, he knew uh, the Hebrew as well as the Greek, if I remember correct. And when you witness to them, you've got to know the blessed book. And what I'm saying to you is that we would go in and we'd share that love and share the Word of God. But you can't do that if you don't know the Word. Are you with me tonight? And so it pays. You, you can be on visitation and God dealing with the heart and, and He's drawing them to that place of repentance. And you can see the Word of God just take and slice that heart up, if I could say it to you like that. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing sunder of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the hearts of men. And that's what I mean by slicing the heart up and bringing that man to a place of conviction or that woman to a place of conviction and a calling of God. Uh, you know, when you think about this fellowship with whom we should lodge, uh, there's things in common, and then there's things in a conversion. And as you think about this, I, I have a question. Is yours a fellowship or a camaraderie? Or is yours a fellowship and a cherished relationship? Gail and I, not here, not in this, you know, not here in Anchorage or not even in Alaska. We went into a restaurant the other night, and we sat down, and we were minding our business, Right behind us was two elderly ladies, white hair, gray hair, precious, distinguished-looking ladies. And in a few minutes, in walked five men, one older man, and four younger men, and three young ladies. One had a baby. And so they began to talk. They brought out their Bud Stupid, their Miller Low Life. They began to guzzle and drink. And after a while, I wanted to go over and say, hey, there's ladies over here. Why don't you mind your business? Or excuse me, why don't you curtail some of the words that you're using? They were just vulgar. You say, why you didn't? Because the odds of five against one don't sound too good to me, amen? And the Bible says, cast not your pearls before swine. So I just walked out when I finished. 
Is your fellowship a camaraderie? Or is your fellowship a cherished relationship with Christ? What do you mean? I'm talking about, number one, a resurrected Lord. As the old song would say, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor from his dark domain, and he ever liveth with his saints to reign. Our Savior's resurrected. What did he say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4? For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and was buried and raised uh, again the third day according to the Scriptures. When you think about the word gospel, it comes from the Anglo-Saxon words gospel, or excuse me, gospel comes from the Anglo-Saxon words gospel, and it means the good news. What is that good news? That our Lord has resurrected. He's seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father. He's making intercession to the, according, uh, for the saints according to the will of God. Romans 8 and verse 26, Likewise the Spirit itself helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should preach as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. And there he is. I've said this before to you. He turns to the Father. The Holy Spirit brings up the petition. He turns to the Father. And the Father sends back grace and mercy to help in time of need. Hebrews 4, verse 14 through 16. And then, listen, is it a cherished relationship? Uh, you know, the Bible teaches we, are a, we have a new birth. Let me start out with that one. And you find that in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. Let me go there and let me think about this. Uh, Colossians 1, 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, I say whether it be things in heaven or things in earth, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your minds, yet now hath he reconciled. And that word reconcile, it comes from the Greek. It literally means a thorough change from enmity and aversion unto love and faith and trust in our Lord. We're a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You look in Titus chapter 3, if you will, turn there. And the Bible says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, serving divers, lust and pleasure, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy has saved us. Now get this, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. That word regeneration, it was a word that was used quite often in that day by the classical writers. And the, uh, uh, the picture that I, I would give to you uh, you know snow up here. If we have a snow uh, of one to two inches down home, I mean, it knocks everything in the head. Nobody moves. Uh, the buses are, uh, you know, nobody, no school, uh, you know, for whatever. And, and, you know, before the first snow has dissipated, here comes another one. And, you know, maybe another one like that. But if you go down to the creek, if you go down to the riverside, down by there, you'll see where a little seed has fallen into the ground. And that little seed is coming forth. That is regeneration. And we become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Does it not joy your heart and soul I'm, I, that you want to... Uh, be around or be with our Savior, the one that redeemed us, that loved us, that he changed our heart and he made us new in Christ Jesus and he's brought us into the family of God. Oh, I could go on, may I say to you, our new creation, our walk. You find that in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1 and he uses the word worthy. And the word worthy there, I, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And he tells us next, uh, two and three, about humbly and so forth. Let me go on very quickly. But as you think about this, it's a walk worthy. It, it's after a godly sort. It's appropriately. Regeneration, reconciliation, redemption, justification, 
comes and we're new in Christ Jesus. You've heard it before about justification. I'll make mention of this. I'll go on just as if I had never sinned. But it don't stop there. Just as if I had always been. It is a reversal of God's attitude towards a sinner because of our new position and relationship that we have in Christ Jesus. Before we were saved, we were under condemnation. Before we were saved, we were headed for hell. Before we would say, uh, were saved, we would come out of hell and stand before God at the great white throne judgment and give an account. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Oh, that's mercy. Mercy is receiving what we don't deserve, amen? And God gave us mercy. Do you remember that glorious night? Do you remember that glorious day? Do you remember that glorious time where you called out and asked the Lord to save and forgive and now you're his? I remember that in my life. I got saved July the 25th, way back yonder. 1973, some of y'all wasn't even found under the cabbage patch yet, were you, amen? You wasn't even born yet, amen. But God had mercy. I, I was 21 years old. My wife, she rededicated her life, and uh, she, was, she got saved when she was eight. She should have never married me. I think she rededicated, I got saved about two months after we were married. She was ready to go home to her mother and her father. I was ready to let her go home. But oh, listen, God saved me, changed my life. She rededicated her heart. We started going to church. We started serving the Lord. We first heard about missionaries. We heard about missionaries on the foreign field, and we took on some missionaries and at that church, the little independent Baptist church in Dalton, Bible Way Baptist Church. Our pastor was Bobby Blue. His brother was Ed. He was a well-known well-respected evangelist. And you know, we just started serving the Lord. We just had a time. We just go out on visitation, knock on doors. I remember the first family the Lord let me win to Christ. Does these things not thrill your soul? Does these things not charge your heart? Does these things not move and make, I mean, just want to kick a little bit, amen? That's all right. It's free of charge, amen? I had double hip replacement. Preacher, I'm doing pretty good, amen? Let me go on very quickly. May I say to you, listen, fellowship that's cherished with our Savior. Thirdly, his love for the brethren. I'll give you three things here very quickly. I'll make mention of them. Turn in your Bibles, 1 John chapter 3. Notice with me, if you'll notice in this passage, and brought us with them uh, one nation of Cyprus. Now, where's he at? He's in fellowship with the brethren. And, and this old gentleman, how old he is, I don't know, but he wants fellowship. He invites them into his house, he invites them into their home. Brother McGovern, I don't know if you remember this or not. Many long years ago, my son was a young preacher who went to Crown College. Um, long story short, we come up and we stayed with you in your home, you and the miseries and your children. I remember looking out the window in our bedroom and there was a big moose looking in at us. Uh, you know, and, and, and I've never forgot that, Pastor. I've never forgot that. And then off you go, and you're in Papua New Guinea and serving the Lord. And I'm, I'm thinking, he'll never be back. And now, look, lo and behold, God has made him pastor of the church, a great church, a good church, a church that you want to be a part of, united with. Amen? And so, uh, fellowship. May I say to you, his love for the brethren. Notice with me in 1 John. Notice how he says it. 
Behold, he starts out, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not, and it doth not yet appear that what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now notice, come back with me, and I want you to understand the comprehending of his love. And what I mean by that, he starts out and he says, Behold, what manner of love and, and what he's saying is, stop, look, listen, see, taste this gracious love. This gracious love. Oh, when you and I were wicked, when we were vile, what did he say in Ephesians 4? I'm about quoting every verse I know, amen. Verse 17, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as the other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. But God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. How? In and through or by the face of Jesus Christ. Oh, what manner of love. He's, he's saying, stop, look, ponder, think, meditate on this love. And he shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. Now, I know I've got to hurry here, okay? Y'all look like I need to anyway. I'm joking, I'm joking. May I say to you, there's the communication of his love. Look in Ephesians, well, let me just quote it to you. I'll give you two very quickly. Ephesians 1 verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. And Colossians chapter 1 and verse 4, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all saints. There is that communication. There is that sharing. Well, I don't know what to say. Just tell what happened to you. Just tell what happened to you. Just share it with them. Pass out a gospel tract. May I say to you, listen... There's the consecration of our love. 1 John 3 and verse 14, I've not memorized this one. We know that we have passed from death unto life. Why? Because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Now I want to give you one more. I've got two, but I'm going to give you one more. There is his likeness of Christ until he's called home. Notice with me. I can only guesstimate when he was saved. That's why I gave you three riders. Now he's old. Does someone have to help him as he goes? But may I say to you, listen, he's an old disciple and his likeness of Christ, God's working it out in him. Turn, let me give you two, and I'll be done right here. Philippians 1 and verse 21. Notice with me what he says. He says, for to me to live is Christ. We usually say, for me to live is Christ, but it's for to me to live is Christ, and die is gain. I think what he's saying in that passage is, this is what I want. This is where I'm determined to be and stay. You do what you want to do. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. That's what he wants out of you. you. You know, when you and I got saved, let me use this podium for just a minute. It's made out of 
looks like a beautiful dark oak. It's painted in white and then the darkness of the oak. They cut down a live tree. They saw it out. They put it together. Maybe there's some knots along the way. So someone... They take that sandpaper. Then they'll stain it, urethane it, probably. Put it together, and you have a beautiful piece of pulpit. And may I say to you tonight, Christ the Lord's doing the same thing in each and every one of us. Do I have rough edges? I sure do. And you know what? You do too. But one of these days, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to do all things unto himself. Turn in your Bibles. Romans chapter 8, you know verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Look in verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. These young people on the front here, mother, he's conforming. He's conforming. He's working out. Until only, Christ only always, living in me. Isn't that how the song says it? He's bringing us into the image of his dear son. How about you tonight? Where are you at? Where are you at? Are you being molded into his image? Are you yielding to the will of God? Are you doing what he wants? Does my next chaplain for Alaska sit right here? But I can't be. Can't never could. The old saying says can't never could, but can, can. I've changed that. We used to hear that when I was a kid down home. It was just a, I guess, a southern little old slang. Can't never could, but can, can. I've changed it. Can't never could. But God can. God can. God can take you and use you. Mom, Dad, what if God called your children? What if your son goes off to Bible college? And he major, majors in missions. What if he goes to a faraway place? You're taking my babies. You can't take my... They're not your babies. They're theirs. Your son and his wife. Let God... They're, they're better off with God. If you just trust God, let God do what he wants to do in their lives. I think about one of our men, Brother Robert and Miss Debbie Keaton. And Brother Robert, he's a precious man. You pray for him as COPD. His daughter went off to Bible college, met a young man. I think they're working towards 20 years. Is that not right, Brother David? His daughter and, and son-in-law are working to, of 20 years. They've been into Africa. They come home from a service open up the door, and his wife, uh, Brother Keaton's daughter, she finds four cobras in their house. But you know what? They raised their kids. God saw them through that. They have one in Mongolia now. They have another one. Their grandchildren, 
uh, in another country. I think they have, is it three, two, or three? Brother Dave, do you know offhand where they're in foreign field serving our Lord? And that's what Christ wants to do out of your life. Would you pray with us and pray for us? We need chaplains here. As one mission board said it, and I added one to it, if not you, who? If not here, where? If not now, when? Let's pray. Would you do that with me?